Hello and welcome to Real Talk with me, Azania. On this day in 1994, South Africans young and old poured into voting stations in their masses to make their mark. The day was one of mixed emotions for all, emotions of fear and uncertainty on one hand, but of course hope and palpable excitement with the anticipation for a better future on the other. One thing was certain though, South Africa would never be the same again. All citizens of the Democratic Republic of South Africa were finally free, free to exercise their right to vote and rewrite the wrongs of our painful past. When in 1979, Solomon Kalushi Masangu said, my blood will nourish the trees that will bear the fruits of freedom, end quote, little did he know how much more blood would be shed by our struggle icons. Freedom still remains a touchy subject in conversations, whether they are political, economic, or about the social state of our country. Today's panel is made up of guests who will share their views on how free our freedom really is 24 years into democracy. What are your views? Are we really free? Our first guest is Pumlani Pikoli. Pumlani, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. Well, you were six years old, right, when we had our first democratic elections. Yeah. So were you aware of what was going on in South Africa at the time? I, I remember. I think it was like, a, well, my, my parents were like active um, yeah. members of the struggle. So I guess there was like a weird sort of um, acknowledgement. Um, I mean, I, I can remember the day, you know, like it meant a lot and stuff like that. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess there was, but also as a kid, you don't really care about stuff that like, you know, doesn't affect you immediately. So I think I just wanted to play Nintendo at the stage. Yeah. yeah. But broadly speaking in your uh, upbringing, because they were so political, were you shielded from the realities of what was going on in this country? Oh, no. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I, like, uh, by that stage, I mean, I knew they were active in something, but I didn't know what, it, even if I didn't know necessarily what it was. Um, you know, I, I, I still even got a memory of, like, my mom coming back from a protest um, mm. when, I was, when I was a kid, and she was, and yeah, she was in a state, um, just, I mean, to put it lightly. And, um, yeah, I, I, it, we knew that, that we weren't living the same life that other kids seem to be having. So, right, so, so yeah. this was very alive in your home. Yeah. You probably had guests who are very influential today just dropping in and you were able to hear these profound conversations going on. Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, you know, as you grow up, you, you realize more and more like who's who and, and you start to recognize like, hey, that's, that guy's on TV, but he was just yeah. drinking here yesterday. Oh. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, no, I mean, you, you are like, you know, alive to it, yeah. um, you know, those ideas. But yeah, it takes a while to completely sort of understand what it is that's going on and, mm. and, and sort of start articulating um, those experiences and those interactions and why there would be difference to the other kids that you'd probably be going to school with or, you know, yeah. or your peers because I suppose you, you exist sort of, uh, you know, on your parents as friends in terms of social circles. So everybody's got similar experiences almost. So that was the norm. And then going yeah. to school was like the trip, like, okay, um, the, things aren't, you know, as, mm. as, as mm. Um, cut and dry as what, as what they seem. So with all of this political influence, did it somehow shape your views, politically speaking? Well, I mean, definitely. I mean, if you, you, um, you know, with parents who who are active within, within there's no way to escape it. Yeah, within a party, within a struggle, and those are your social. That's your socialization. That's how you know you're you're taught to think, and the way you interact with um, adults is is shaped by those sort of worldviews. You know, so mm -hmm. I don't want to call it a cult, but like, <laughs> <laughs> but like you know, you're immersed in like political history from the jump. You know, mm -hmm. so. So, and, and, you know, different ideologies and being exposed to different ways of thinking and dissecting thoughts and, and all of that. So it is, it is, it is a trip. Yeah. yeah. So in your book, you first published a couple of essays and then you added a few more essays and then you got published. The Fatuous State of Severity. Yeah. In it, you tell these stories in a very cheeky manner of everyday inter uh, interactions. I loved reading it, by the way, so compliments yeah. to you. Thank so you. what was Thank the you purpose? For um, <laughs> I mean, initially, I, I, it was just a sort of vehicle and expression for me to get out my, my fiction because yeah. uh, I'd chilled I'd and, and just been a, a journalist writing for money for so long, um, and I'd left my fiction behind. Yeah. And so, um, you know, the, st uh, the stories out there that I was in a, a psychiatric clinic at the time when I wrote most of the stories, and then I decided, wait, okay, I'm actually going to pull this together and publish it. And it's, it's, it's sort of a way of 
unpacking, you know, the, the realities that like I'd found myself immersed in. Yeah. Um, and just trying to do it in the most interesting way as, as uh, possible, you know, so taking the most mundane situations and mm -hmm. just making them the most ridiculous things, but still, you know, rooting it within, um, you know, a truth within the societal fabric that probably goes untouched at different points in time. And you did that quite successfully, and I think in a way that a lot of young people will be able to relate to these issues and probably also reflect on how they've encountered these issues in their own daily lives. But truthfully speaking, do you even think a book like that would have been published before our democracy? Before our democracy? Mm. I mean, we were living in a Calvinistic regime. <laughs> you know, um, so yeah, it would have been published, but it would have been underground. Mm -hmm. um, and it would, I mean, it would have probably been cooler um, you know, being published in that time um, because of the danger to it. But um, yeah, I, but I, I suppose, but there is some interesting literature though from, you know, pre-democracy pre that was commercially published. Yes. So I think it, it's also worthwhile to like look at some of those and touch on some of those and, you know, see, and even if they did get banned at some point in time. So yeah, yeah so I, I, I don't know if it would have been commercially published. Right, yeah. so do you appreciate that this, freedom of expression, this freedom to be able to put out your thoughts in this way? Well, I definitely um, can't say that I don't. Mm. Um, you know, there's this really cool moment in the Nina Simone documentary when they ask her, uh, what does freedom mean to you? And she said, no fear, like a life without fear, you yes. know? So I, I fear very different things to what you know, many before me, um, you know, had to fear, you know, you know, uh, physical sort of uh, intimidation and, and abuse and, and all of that and, you know, restricted and limited uh, mobility, um, you know, so definitely like I can, I can definitely appreciate the fact that I can write a book with some of the most ridiculous things that I could think of, the most absurd and crass sometimes in nature, well, yes. the vulgarity of it as well, you know, because for me, I, I play high regard um, on vulgarity well placed in society because we have so many polite conversations. So I, I, I dig the idea of being impolite and polite company. <laughs> in fact, one of the chapters, is in, in two of the chapters, Alexander and Sizwe uh, Kutruano, mm. you talk about an interaction, young mm. people with uh, someone who's serving them and someone who's rude back to them because they speak in English. And a lot of young people would be able to relate to that where there is sort of often a disconnect between how you express and how it's received. Yeah. And I, and I think those those are the kind of things I, I what I want, really wanted to peel back on is like sort of the um, interactions that that black kids going through middle class spaces right. sort of have right. to like sort of inhabit and you know, you know on a daily on a daily basis you know we're we're surrounded by um, different levels of you know black labor um, and the privilege and the access that we have shapes a completely different worldview to what a lot of what the majority yeah. um, of, of black South Africans go through, you know, on the daily. And so it's, it's really finding about, you know, trying to find those, like, those phrases, those keys, those moments, and, mm -hmm. and trying to tear back those layers and not just, you know, speak about um, politics and engage with politics and yes, Fanon says this, this and that, and then you keep Fanon at a distance, yeah. but like trying to um, unpack him in your on, in your day-to-day -day interactions um, right. kind of thing. Well, Pumlani, you're staying with us. You'll be back in our panel later on. And I want you to just ponder on your view of freedom in South Africa today. We'll get your thoughts later on. Well, thank you so much to Pumlani, and he'll join us again. But one of the freedoms we have that we've been afforded, in fact, is the freedom of speech. And while we're not all as responsible with it as we should be, what kind of democracy we, would we have if we were not able to express our dissatisfaction with the status quo? It's a very important freedom. There's more after the break. The first time in 1979, South Africa was really separated by race. Blacks did not go in and out the country. Uh, had to have passbooks, humiliation. There's no longer separation by race, it's separation now by resources. It's no longer separation by race, separated by resources. Access to capital. Mm. 
That was a part of a speech by Reverend Jesse Jackson after Mamouini's funeral, addressing what the majority of South Africans consider as an area in which they still disenfranchised their economy. But first listen to this, and I quote, I've had a conversation with my parents about freedom. Their views are different to mine. They celebrate that they can walk freely in the streets and not get arrested. They can talk freely to anyone, black or white. And funny enough, they believe we have more access to opportunities than they did. I beg to differ, end quote. These are the words of 25-year-old Tepiso Mabula. She joins me now with Buisa Kagatwani to share what freedom means as young black women growing up Ekasi since the 90s. Ladies, thank you so much to both of you for joining us. Pleasure. Tepiso, let me start with you because those were your comments. Yeah. So there's clearly a gap between what your parents consider to be freedom mm -hmm. and what you consider to be freedom. So do they not understand the struggles you face as a black woman? I think... Um, our parents uh, don't understand the struggles we face. And part of that comes from the fact that they lived through the period of euphoria that came after the 1994 elections. Mm -hmm. So for them, um, our struggles are not really struggles per se, but they're more like challenges that we can get through because they don't really get to experience that on a day-to-day -day basis. And how does that make you feel, though? Uh, it's It's... It's, it makes me feel a little bit angry mm -hmm. because I feel like they are part of a generation that, um, for lack of a better word, sort of betrayed us in a sense because um, they kind of accepted this negotiated settlement without thinking past um, what is going, how it's going to affect um, future generations. Mm -hmm. And... So let me come to you. What is your biggest disgruntlement, I should say, about freedom today? I think, obviously, walking in the body that I do, right? Yes, as, as a, a woman, woman in South Africa, in Johannesburg, in the city, I don't think when the conversation around freedom was being had that we were looking at black women's bodies and how they don't, I don't know, access it to the same extent. And I get that in the time, you know, I, I guess the the freedom or the liberation was for, you know, like a racial kind of, framed in a racial kind of framework and a political kind of framework. But politics are personal. So if I am a black woman and I'm living in South Africa and I don't feel like I'm maybe enjoying the same access or resources or rights as men, you mm -hmm. know, then that definitely says to me that I need to extend and think about what freedom means over and above what we've already achieved. So was there something that happened that influenced this view and perhaps shifted it from how you viewed freedom when you were younger? I mean, I guess it comes with growing up, you know? Like, um, I think I've always been an aware person, not yeah. necessarily conscientized or whatever, but just aware of how other people um, are able to enjoy privileges that other people don't. And I, I think, um, if you think about just like growing up in a multiracial school, which is what happened to a lot of us who were born yes. after 1994 or mm -hmm. before, um, you, you see that, like you, that's like your first inclination of like, okay, we're living in the supposedly free South Africa. And Two yet, countries in one. Yes, yeah, but yet, you true. know, like there are all of these kind of discrepancies happening here. Mm. Um, and I think for me, navigating Johannesburg as a city man will really put that kind of, aggression and that kind of, um, I don't know what's the word, I want to say violence, mm -hmm. you know, in your mm -hmm. face, you know, um, going to taxi ranks, <laughs> using public transport, um, those kind of things really alert you to say, actually, this body that I'm in is endangered and I should be protected. Right. Yeah. And I think it's often a subject that we don't reflect on enough. We do in pockets mm -hmm. about the real risks that women always live with. Mm -hmm. Regardless of what you're doing, you know yeah. that there's always this danger that's lurking, always mm -hmm. just around the yeah. corner. So is that one of the contentious areas where you feel that we're not, we haven't done enough, especially to secure the freedoms of women? I think when we were having the conversation, or pre-94, the conversation around freedom and liberation in this country had a very certain face, yeah. you know, which was... It's very patriarchal. Black men, you mm -hmm. know, like what does the freedom, what does freedom look like to black men, you know? And even if you're going to talk about what does freedom look like to black women, it's like in relation to black men. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, that has, I, I mean, I, I don't think at the time 
there was a conversation around it. But I, I mean, I think the whole world, not just in South Africa, we're all going through like um, a rising of consciousness. You know, there are things that are happening right now that were inexcusable, you know, a while ago. So, I, I mean, I was watching a, a deaf comedy jam um, skit from like 98 and I was like if any of those comedians said anything they would say right now their careers yeah. would be over absolutely and I think it, it's just that it's just we're all coming to a space where we're we're looking at what freedom looks like for everyone and not just a very specific person and we're not saying and we're not giving one person mm -hmm. you know the the platform to talk on behalf of everybody else to say I think or we think or I represent like I think everybody wants to stand in their own space and yeah. say actually Yes, we're, you know, allowed to walk around and everything, but this is what freedom means to me. It's more mm -hmm. than that. You know, it's more than freedom of speech or supposed freedom of speech. It's more than freedom of movement. Um, yeah. Right. Tepi, so you also talk about uh, not being able to access university. You know, you're excluded because of uh, lack of finances, mm -hmm. a story that I can relate to. I also had to drop out yeah. because there was no money. So how has that shaped your views and your notions of freedom? This um, inability to access this better life. So you have this period after 1994 and all these promises are made, like there'll be access to education for everyone and this and that. And then you fast forward to 2015, 2016, and you have poor black students being excluded from the same universities that need to afford them that education. Yeah. And when you look at it, it's like as a poor black person or as a working class black person, if you will, I need that education to get me out of my current circumstance. So if I can't access it because of um, things like funds, then it means you are saying that I'm permanently um, meant to be, to be in this sort of working class position. So that for me created um, a desire to want to, to, to see the world in a more truthful sort of manner, you know, it's like, before that, I thought there's this idealistic um, world where everyone has access to things, everyone yeah, has access to opportunities. Table, but exactly. Not. And then you realize that like my blackness is a thing, my sort of working class background is a factor, and it's 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 those sorts of things that make you realize that actually um, we have not yet attained that freedom. But when you look at your communities, you know we're all from the township. Yeah. What are the changes that freedom has brought to your community? I, mean, I live in a bougie township. <laughs> yeah, you live in a bougie <laughs> township. Because I've got Oakville, there's a national yeah. heritage site and the Christian <laughs> Club. Like, I mean, but things like that, you know, that the actually, um, who runs the Soweto Christian Club is based in, in Oakville. And he always tells that story about how he, it was almost illegal for him to show jump, mm -hmm. you know, and to see him now running a school, collocationing, that actually, to be honest, he's not even really making money from is, is really important. And it says, actually, we're not just going to use horses for like coals and whatever. Mm -hmm. We can, we have we the ability to, to be show jumpers, to, to be athletes and to be, and I think those are the kind of important things that we need in our, in our hood. So, I mean, my hood has an equestrian club. So. Mine has a golf course. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Will you to be so quick one? Um, I think for me, it's seeing uh, people's individual progress. Um, it's it's watching, you know, young black women like me yes. making it in the corporate world and then coming back to build a nice house for Mama Le Papa. Um, it's those small changes that um, have led me to realize that actually there are some good things that have come with, with this freedom. But we can't rest on our laurels. Mm. We can't rest on it. We Precisely. still have to strive to achieve yeah. more. Yeah, yeah. True. All right. So, you know, these are powerful women with great insights, but women have also been at the forefront of revolutions and struggle protests around the world for centuries. The likes of American heroine Rosa Parks, for instance, and here at home, in 1956, the iconic Women's March to the Union buildings that was led by Lillian Ngoi, Helen Joseph, Rahima Musa, and Sophia Williams de Brain, to name a few. Yet till this day, the role of our mothers in our democracy is not celebrated enough. After the break, I'll be in conversation with Mum Albertina Sosulu's granddaughters. Stay with us.
Two weeks ago, the world and South Africans bid their final farewell to one of the greatest struggle icons of our country, Mama Winnie Madikizela Mandela, a shero who would not, who not only fought for our political liberation, but epitomized the strength and fearlessness of a woman her entire life. It would be a great injustice not to also mention other greats like Abu Mama Adelaide Tambo, Albertina Sisulu, Amina Kachalia, and Helen Sussman, to name a very few of the women that we owe our thanks to for our democracy. Nsigi and Buyelwa Sisulu, granddaughters of the late great Walter and Albertina Sisulu, are passionate gender activists and they join us now. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us on this historic day. Thank you for having us. Thank you for so you are both gender activists and in your view, what are some of the biggest and commonly dismissed challenges that South African women face? Sigi? What are the challenges that we face? I mm. think the disposal of women's stories, their lived experiences, and how much their voice is actually subdued uh, when they talk about injustices and inequalities and the lack of freedom really within their very household. I think those are one, a few of the challenges that we yeah, face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Vrielo, what do you think, especially as a young black woman in this country? Um, I'm not so much a gender activist, but I'm, I'm, I'm an attorney and um, there are inequalities that we experience not only as women in, in the profession, but just as, as black women. Mm. Um, mm. And these, these inequalities obviously then stem from, you know, the past regime and the, 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 the dispensation. The yeah, system. the patriarchal system. Yeah, so that then becomes a domino effect into the workplace, mm. um, yeah. Mm. And the reality is that it's 24 years into our democracy yeah. and yet we still face these mm -hmm. challenges. Yeah. And often it, it can be fatiguing, it can be tiring, sure. you know, to continuously beat the drum about the same issues over and over again. So how long do you think this will take? And I know you have to look into your crystal ball, but in your view, do you think it's a struggle that will win? It's a struggle that we, should, we must win. Mm. I think we all choose our struggles. And I think our grandparents and our parents have gotten us this far. And then, for example, right. the vision of a free education was a vision that they had, but it was the free, fees must fall students who actually carried and realized that vision. Uh, they mm. were, of course, chastised a lot about how they did it. But the truth is that the fire burnt within them enough mm. for them to take up the cause. We need to know that the fire burns enough in us as women to take up the cause. And I, I know that we almost want to applaud when men join the cause, but the truth is that it's the patriarchal system that they continue to, perp to perpetuate in the country and er elsewhere across religion, mm -hmm. across culture, mm -hmm. uh, across uh, social class. Mm -hmm. And as a result, it's pervasive and continues. Yeah. And, and so we, we must, as women, be the voice, yes. Mm -hmm. And, and, and when, when we need to, we have to then bring them on board as well yeah. to, to advance the cause. And now, uh, Riola, back to you. You said that mm. you're an attorney. Yes. And you know when it comes to the law, mm. it's almost as if, as women, we have to be forearmed and very aware mm. of the rights that we have. Yeah. Otherwise, we'll continue to be disenfranchised. Definitely. Um, it's, 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 a it's, a con it's a struggle. Mm -hmm. Like Unsigi had said, that you know, it's something that we need to perpetuate and we need to drum it in mm. to 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 our male counterparts. That look, we're here. Um, gender is not a thing for us. We're here. We we're educated. We just want our seat at the table. We want the table. <laughs> <laughs> so, not just the seat. <laughs> yeah, we want the table, and um. You know, it would be such a disservice if we then not carry on the struggle, the fight that our grandparents did because um, mm. it would be such an injustice on their part because they fought for so long to get us to where we are and what then if we then just leave it and say, okay, well, you know, we live in a democratic society, you know, we all have rights well and good, but forget, you know, the nuances that yeah. continually just keep you know, being perpetuated um, that, you know, oh, just because you're a woman, um, you can't do all. It's enough just to get a little bit mm. of the pie. You're right. So oh. you come from a family with great legacy, mm. a great history. Mm. Do you, have you experienced your struggles, would you say, in the same way as ordinary black women? Is it the same for you? Um, in part. Mm -hmm. In part, it is. Uh, and in other ways, you're advantaged. And disadvantaged, yeah. both. 
Mm. Uh, we have both. Uh, the, the, uh, and I think uh, one of my aunts who was on Twitter had actually mentioned something about the Sulu family. And somebody said, well, you should go to your trust fund. And there's that assumption that somewhere there's a trust fund that has actually paid for our education mm. and or has gotten us where we are. Mm. And so you, you're almost living to debunk the myth uh, around that. And then obviously trying to, and as women generally, need to prove ourselves a little bit more mm. than men have to, whether it's in education, how we speak, how we carry ourselves, how we dress and how we present our facts. You know, you almost have to be extra eloquent for them to actually recognize you. So because initially that's what you appear is what they see and what they decide. And so is the case for all women, right? right? And so on the surface of it, yes. But as people then get to know who you are, there, there are the assumptions that they have. But we can't live on those perceptions and those assumptions. Uh, but we simply are aware of them. Yeah, mm. I can imagine. So there are benefits, there are those disadvantages that sure. just come with the surname. Just like <laughs> they artists. come with being black. Mm. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So are there hidden achievements and areas of progress that were perhaps, that we fail to highlight enough, especially when it comes to freedoms that women sure. enjoy that we, we don't highlight enough? Mm. Jay? <laughs> it's like they're not enough for you you know they're not coming to mind because they're simply yeah. not there yeah no i think it's, it's well we could get caught in what Vuvu was talking about earlier which is the perils of freedom that mm. once you have it you actually don't know what it's like not to have it mm -hmm. and and so the women and our, our generation and others who would have been born into a certain amount of freedom and that when you you don't actually don't know what it's like not to vote you don't know what it's like to actually be on the margins yeah. and i and you know marginal and we talk about vulnerability which is not necessarily what a term that i i, I like very much mm -hmm. but being on the margins you're at the table, you're on the paper, but you're on the margin. Just mm. stay on the side. Don't interfere too much. Mm -hmm. And that's why you have to fight for 50% representation as just almost a token representation. Then you have to fight to say, no, actually, we're able. We're not just tokens. So there's a marginalization, but there's also a vulnerability that is very real around our private spaces and where violence actually happens. Yes. And, and there's a further vulnerability around young women. Obviously, in our country, in the South African context, as free as we might be, you look at uh, girls who are on the age of 14 to young women, age of 24, with an HIV AIDS rate of 2,000 girls being affected a week. It's mm -hmm. really a lot Alarming, but mm. the male counterparts don't have the same data or statistics. And that tells you that the vulnerability of a 14-year-old who gets affected and the 14-year-old male counterpart who it's doesn't, the they are disadvantaged and therefore need a particular yeah. uh, attention yeah. paid to what kind of safety net do we have for young girls, for example. Right, and yeah. we, have, we, we often don't think of the most vulnerable when we create policy, when we create sure. regulation. So much of the world has mm. been built with men in mind and mm. less so with women. Yeah, yeah. So mm. the time has to come where we start thinking with, with that as a starting point. Mm. Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you. Mm. Thank, Thank you for you. being here. Yes. Well, our country was divided across late racial lines for many, many decades. There was intolerable cruelty, land dispossession, segregation, and of course, bloodshed became the norm. When we finally achieved our government of national unity, we celebrated thinking that it was the end of an era of black versus white, the birth of our rainbow nation. But it was only the beginning. It really was the beginning of the hard conversations and issues that we need to have and issues that till this day are tiptoed around. We're talking Freedom Day in 2018. Stay tuned for more. The subject of white privilege ruffles many feathers when it's brought up. A heavily contentious issue many white people deny even exists. My next guest is Kirsty Fletcher. A few years ago, as part of her postgraduate research studies, she started the White Privilege Project, and it opened a huge can of worms, not to mention making her very unpopular with some people. Kirsty, welcome to Real Talk. Hi. So how unpopular are you <laughs> with the white community for this project and your views? It's quite interesting. I've had a lot of um, people unfriend me on Facebook and I'm no longer in their Christmas list. Um, sure. And people have gotten very, very angry with me, uh, mainly because when you raise the concept of white privilege, they're not willing to even acknowledge um, that even today there is white privilege. There's structural racism in play today 
And we still have white privilege today. Yeah. And I know everybody's going to get Any tense. death threats? Because, you know, no, social media no. is where people hide behind their profiles. I'm not on Twitter. Um, right. I, so I, I keep away from social media for, mm -hmm. for most intents and purposes. I, I try not to. Yeah. There's too many online trolls. <laughs> like. So take me through your journey. You know, this journey of understanding and discovering that you are a beneficiary of white privilege. You know, I grew up in a boarding school in Potchefstroom yeah. for 10 years. So I didn't even really realize that apartheid existed. And for years, um, 1994 happened. My eldest child was like a year old and we went to go vote. And I, even then, I didn't realize what had happened. And it was when I went to UNISA mm -hmm. and I started studying there. And I was standing in the library one day and I realized I was standing next to a person of color who could speak five languages and was studying in English, which wasn't even his first language. Mm. And I suddenly realized something like this is a big thing. And some of the subjects we did for visual arts sort of led you down the path to discover what your privilege was and what happened in the country. Um, and then I got into the project of white privilege and understanding how I benefited and how the laws that were structured from the 1800s benefited me, benefited my mother, my grandmother, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, decades of legislation. It's decades of legislation, and what you have then is you have generational wealth and knowledge that's handed down. Yeah. It doesn't disappear. Yeah. Um, my father-in-law, who, who has passed on, um, was quite an amazing man, but he recognized his privilege and he wrote that he'd had access to banking facilities, which is something we don't think about now. But for many years, people of color didn't have access to banks. Mm -hmm. They didn't know what interest was. They didn't have access to that. They couldn't take out a home loan. They couldn't have access to, to money to start a business. Yeah. It's, it's small things like that, but it adds up over time. Mm. So what is White Privilege Project? So it was a project that I started, uh, it's twofold. It's one, to get white people to acknowledge their privilege. Yeah. And, and it's not just to say I'm privileged. It's to say I'm privileged, how? How are you privileged? Understand the how and exactly. how structurally it's all, it, it's all structured to favor you. Exactly, I'm, I'm taught in English. Um, religion, God is, 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 for the most intent and purposes, God is uh, perceived to be this tall, blonde, uh, white man. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, big beard, Societal yes. norms. Mm. Pale skin, blue eyes, you've got to look a certain way. Mm -hmm. All the top ten models of the world, they're all white. All the top actresses, all white. Um, and then you've got uh, its education as well. So it's, it's all of these like structures in place and they haven't changed. Yes, and I'm sure with time, you've gradually built even more or realized even many more things that add to this privilege yeah. because it's not just a couple of, a handful of things we can list on our hands. The list is really big. And it's subtle. You go to a shopping center. If I walk out and the alarm goes off, I'm not, not seen as a suspect. You're not the suspect. Not, of course not. Yeah. It's like, any person of color walks out and that alarm goes off and there's like 20 people surrounding them with AK-47s. It's mm. ridiculous. Mm. The, 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 the privileges afforded to me simply on, based on my skin color, it's, it is, it's ridiculous. So what's the most problematic thing about white privilege in South Africa? For white people, we need to let go. We need to understand that our culture is merely different and not superior. We're not superior to other people. Um, a good example is Western culture believes in retributive justice. Yes. I actually think restorative justice is a better way to go. I think if you've been caught stealing or mm. if you, uh, most people, if they're gonna commit a crime, you've gotta look at why they're committing the crime, where they're coming from. And if you can put them back into the community to work off um, some kind of way that, you know, to work off their debt to society as opposed to putting them in a prison, which just turns them into a, a, a harder criminal. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a better way to go? Mm. Now, 
retributive justice is a Western concept. We used to put debtors, the people who defaulted on their debts, we used to put them in prison. Mm. So, and we're still putting people in prison, but it doesn't fix them and it doesn't fix society. So yeah. that's one example where And I is think it holding us back? Is white privilege holding us back and a denial of it? Yes, I think so. Mm. I, I still think we're running these two countries at play here. And I've started learning Zulu and I'm abysmal. I'm like the kid at the back of the class who doesn't get any of the lessons. <laughs> but I also realized that there's an entire culture and language and stuff that's happening around me that I don't get and I don't understand um, because I've, I've, I, I, don't, I don't speak the language. Is it about the willingness and caring to understand, caring to know? And often that is where people fail to start. There's just no interest in wanting to know the other person's lived experience. I think it is. I think it's it's partly the, the lack of interest. And then I th also think it's a sense of superiority. Mm -hmm. I think there's, um, someone once said to me, no, you know, I'll, I'll respect them if they respect me. And I'm like thinking to myself, but here's the deal. You're expecting them to act according to your societal norms and your culture and what you think is appropriate, as opposed to you just sitting down and going, okay, let's have an open conversation. Um, Polygamy is one of them. Yeah. Culturally, I don't practice polygamy. Um, my husband knows this. <laughs> He's very aware of this. <laughs> but who am I to say yeah. that if everybody's consensual, who, who am I to say that it's a, it's that a wrong, wrong thing? Yeah, yeah. So where do so. we be begin to address this then? In your view, well, I think obviously your, what you started with the project is one way, yeah. but we do need a broader societal change. I wish I could take everyone to the Apartheid Museum for a start. I think for me that was a hugely traumatic experience because I'd never realized and um, I can trace my family lineage right back to the Van Deventers, which was part of the big, the Groot Trek as they call it. Mm -hmm. And if we could just sit down and people could just understand exactly what happened and the privilege afforded to people because of those laws. We made atrocity legal. Yeah. We really a did. violation of human rights is what the UN called it. Exactly. And people don't understand that. And that sense of superiority is, is that we, yeah, that's, we've got to get rid of that. Got to get rid of that. Kirsty, thank <laughs> you very much. Thank you so much. Well, thank you to Kirsty, and she'll be staying with us because after the break, we actually look into black privilege. Yes, black privilege also exists. Stay with us. This is Real Talk. Well, due to the nature of our country's historical struggles being political, we often ignore the fact that there are beneficiaries of the struggle. So I'd like for us to talk about black privilege, the elite class who have access to most of the things that the majority of black South Africans don't. People in political and business circles and their affiliates, their descendants, for instance, even if by choice they would not agree, enjoy what could be termed as black privilege. So joining Kirsty and I are Pumlane and Sebi. So welcome back, guys. So what do you think? Do you agree that there is such a thing as black privilege? Definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. So how would you define it, though? Um, I think privilege is it's relative. Yeah. Um, you are placed in a better position than someone else based on how you look, the things that you have, and sometimes the kind of family that you're born into. Yes. So, so it's that intersectionality precisely. of where you are located precisely. in society. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So do you think that the two uh, court each other comfortably, white privilege, black privilege, and which do you feel most oppressed by? Term, mm. The term black privilege isn't sitting that well with me, yeah. to be honest. Um, that's what I, I want, yeah, that's why I asked you, how, what do you I, think I, of I, the notion? I, I can't, like, I mean, cool, we, we can talk about, I mean, like, the, the classist accesses that, like, allow you uh, greater access to, to, um, to be considered as privileged, right? But then to racialize that as black then sort of 
nullifies like the entire idea because the political meaning of, of blackness is being completely deprived of agency and will, you know, mm -hmm. um, and any sort of like political or, um, you know, uh, political or economic mobility. So, I don't know, can we maybe talk about privilege consciousness or, yeah. you know, so, so, but black privilege, it, they just don't, it, it doesn't make sense. Because it doesn't definitely refer to the majority of people within yeah, the group. Yeah, for sure, because I think when we speak about racism, right, we're speaking about like, you know, structural, structural, um, structural exclusion. Yeah. Um, based on, uh, you know, the, the construct of race, and that's cool, right, but then, and then we can speak about like economic privilege and and different sectors of the society. So I mean, we can have the the conversation about black sectors of society being privileged and being endowed with, you know, with those accesses. But it's just yeah yeah the the two don't they, I don't know I don't know if it, if they've ever met um, you know in a in a bar or or on a bus, like, <laughs> like, it just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, yeah, I'm more or less with you on that one, because for me, it is about that intersectionality, mm -hmm. and of course, the structural nature of white privilege, which we don't have with mm -hmm. what is now termed black privilege, so absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and your view, Kirsty, this notion? Uh, this is a funny story. Well, it's not a funny story, but it's, so within the neighborhood that I live, um, some Indian folks have moved in and some Muslim folks have moved in and we have a, a like a block watch but they've effectively become white so they've been accepted but they're effectively what I term white because mm -hmm. they meet the economic requirements yeah. of the neighborhood and poor black people so the the the, um, the guys who come to you know do the trash and they they're still seen as black yeah but they 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 are the other, but everybody else who can meet the economic requirements have mm. now suddenly become sort of white and are included in the, the, the neighborhood's affairs. Yes, yes. Who would so there has been a, a sort of an interesting, yeah, there's been such an interesting, and, and I will see Indian, Indian um, neighbors being highly aggressive towards black people because they're poor, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not, not necessarily because they're black. So then you've got that sort of yes. interesting intersection because they've moved into another sort of bubble now. Exactly. And Pumlani, this is some of the themes that you touch on through your essays. Classism as one of those struggles that we need to be so awake to. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, just thinking about all of this, I've actually just got um, uh, Jay-Z's The Story of OJ just like playing in my head. Yes. And I don't know Brilliant if I'm al so. allowed to use one of the words on air, but, um, you know, when do you when do I stop being black you know it's not it's not like when the lights go out some of us are black yeah. <laughs> you, you know what yeah. I mean like um, or your bank accounts yeah not now suddenly You're still black <laughs> for sure but it's also the thing is either way um, you know your your identity is shaped on your the way that you look and the way that you perceive to be you know mm -hmm. so if I'm walking down a street and um, you know there's I, I need to be aware that I, there's a certain distance that I need to keep with women walking down the streets in order to make sure that like, you know, that to sort of respect that boundary kind of stuff, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that o that's also like hinged on identity. So it, yeah, like this is a very, it's a very weird one. Like, <laughs> <laughs> But let's come back to freedom. And the fact that we are celebrating Freedom Day, there's still so many hurdles and so many challenges. What do you believe is the biggest stumbling block, this thing that prevents us from fully realizing the freedoms that we want to enjoy and aspire for? I think for me, it's first of all, admitting that we need to level the playing field. We need to um, be honest enough to say the way we perceive our freedom to be right now is not necessarily um, it, it doesn't really define freedom in a true sense. Right. So we need to be able to say there are things that we missed out on um, back in 1994 that we need to correct, and we have to be honest about it. And part of being honest is like not policing how people complain about um, the places in which they've been placed in the society. Mm -hmm. You know. So it requires like serious honesty from everybody, so that those who do have um, what is perceived as privilege will be able to say, okay, I can let go of a little bit of my privilege to ensure that the people who are at the bottom mm -hmm. of the feeding chain 
um, also benefit from the so-called freedom. And in a lot of ways, this is ongoing work beyond this generation, mm -hmm. because yeah. when we realize certain freedoms that we are awake to, based on the global consciousness at the time, mm -hmm. there's always the next level to True. move towards. So it can never be a job that is done, mm -hmm. you know, a goal that we attain and then we are then in a utopia. It's a constantly moving goalpost. So whatever freedoms we wanted and we fought for that were ushered in in 94 are certainly different from the demands that we have around our freedoms today. Mm -hmm. So what do you think of that idea and where is that next level of freedoms that we need to secure? The Gini coefficient in this country yeah. is the highest in the world. We have the, the worst, our top CEOs earn ridiculous amounts compared to the lowest workers. Mm. We can start by addressing that. Like immediately we could start by addressing that. Yeah. Shorten the Gini coefficient. We can then fix the education system. We can pay for free university. And as soon as we do that, we uplift the whole country. So China took a long time and a lot of people died um, when they had the, the cultural revolution. Yes. But they've lifted, they've effectively taken 1.5 billion people and they're all educated. Mm. And they've all been uplifted. It isn't sort of certain pockets of the community that are being uplifted. Everybody was uplifted. And we could look to models like that as opposed to, okay, as opposed to sticking with such a capitalist system, we can look to more of a socialist system. We mm -hmm. can do a mix of it yeah. and, and, and make it work. Uh, there is a lot of discontent, uh, or conversations anyway around discontent when it comes to patriarchy, to capitalism, mm -hmm. because the two are like brother and sister. Mm -hmm. They go hand in hand. So dismantling one um, in, and also working to dismantle the other hopefully will open up our society. Final comment from you, Pumlani? Um, yeah, no, I, I, I just say that, um, you know, we'd also, we'd also, you know, it would be dope for us to take into consideration a lot of the things that have already been put in place and to actually encourage active, active citizenship mm -hmm. to hold power um, to account for those different things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we know that the constitution says this, but then how do we make sure that every person who yeah. doesn't necessarily have access to like legal framework all the time is able to enjoy those privileges and freedoms enshrined within the constitution. So oh, active fantastic. citizenship. Fantastic. Wow. Well, Freedom Day 2018, I'm sure you agree, what a time to be alive. A big thank you to all of my guests, Pumlani, Buiswa, Tepiso, Kirsti, Wuyelwa, and Nzidi, for their invaluable contributions and also sharing their frank views on the state of our nation. I leave you with the words of French novelist Amy Césaire, who said, and I quote, no race possesses the monopoly of beauty, intelligence, or force, and there is a place for all at the rendezvous of victory, end quote. Happy Freedom Day to all of you, South Africa. Good night.